Oberbootsmann Becker by Stephen Mills Read by Alberto Ruano Smoke, thick and black and full of noxious oil, choked Franz as he came to. Water leapt at his chin. He was lying face down, legs canted at an extreme angle behind, his head clamped in an invisible vice of painful pressure and with the iron tang of blood coating his mouth. Machines thrummed somewhere in the dark, the incessant humming of oil-fired boilers drowned out by screams of dying men. Flames, every sailor's enemy, cast a malevolent glow to push back sullenly at the hideous dark. Franz's heart seized in his chest with stark realization. He tried to scramble up, to stand and escape the cries of his dying shipmates, yet he only managed to push himself to one side with his good hand. Where's my left arm? he thought in panic. The shell had exploded with no warning, not the least notice or alarm, and his world had gone dark in an instant. Now? Now? Men were either fighting for their lives or else fighting the corpses for room. Seawater flooded his nose, its level rising slowly in the confined space of the ruined battery. The wretched seaman rolled onto his back and used his right arm to feel for its twin, but it came away empty. Not fully empty, really, for he held a chunk of sticky meat where his left arm used to be, its thick liquid coating his fingers. Head swimming, he leaned forward and vomited, tears stinging his cheeks as his chest heaved. No alarm sounded, no lights or commands. The only noises which reached Franz's ears were the groans and screams of the mortally wounded and the flames which had found purchase on combustibles elsewhere. Get up, Matrose Bauer! a gruff voice called from the dark. Get up! It does not good to die here! Franz choked back tears, the acid tang of bile burning his throat. My arm, Oberbootsmann Becker, he groaned. What of it? It's gone. How about the rest of you? Do you want to lose that too? Franz shook his head. No. Take off your belt, Matrose Bauer. The seaman did as he was told, though finding purchase with his right hand proved difficult. Seawater rose a little higher, the ship's deck dipping to a noticeable list. Franz lost his balance and stuck his remaining hand out, then screamed as he grabbed a man's shoulder. It did not move. Bile rose again, but Franz choked it down. Moreau's flames flickered nearby, the angry light illuminating the corpse's face. Ernst Miller, Franz realized in horror. Stop screaming, Matrose, the salty chief barked. Take off your goddamn belt and tie it around your arm. Franz bit his lip, adjusted his body, then reached to his waist with a trembling hand. The oily water had made the metal buckle slick, but he worked in the dark to lose its loop, then pulled the end of the belt free. Grunting with the effort and biting his lip against pain, he slowly managed to pull the belt from his trouser loops. Hurry, the old chief grunted. I'm trying, Oberbootsmann. Franz had fallen backward in exhaustion. His head swam from blood loss and shock. There is no trying, Matrose, the veteran scolded his junior sailor. There is only to do or to die, and unless you want to die, then I suggest you get to doing. Franz did not bother to answer. Biting back groans, he tried to loop the belt around the stump of his left arm, but it fell and he dropped the belt into filthy water. Again, damn it! You are too young for hell, Matrose Bauer! Do it again! Fear gripped his chest. I don't want to die, he thought. Lay back, son, on the ladder, so you're above the water. Franz did as he was told. The ladders treats what were called stairs on land were cold metal and slick with blood and oil. Good. Now put the belt through the buckle and into the stay. Keep calm, damn it. The seaman followed his chief's instructions. He worked the belt's ends through the buckle and pulled it back on itself through the fabric loop. Slide it up on your arm. A wave of nausea rolled over Franz, his young face white with fear. Concentrate, boy! Listen to my voice! Focus on what I'm telling you! Franz nodded. He was a farm boy, a peasant from the Bavarian hinterland, the sum total of his experience at sea coming in the few short months he had been in the Kaiserliche Marine. 
When the Serbians executed Archduke Ferdinand, the whole country had risen in the patriotic furor. They were young than he and his brother, but as soon as Franz had come of age, he answered the call to arms. Franz's mother had cried, but his stern old father was bursting with pride. It had seemed so long ago now, as he lay in the fouled and oily sea water surrounded by thick smokes, licking flames and the diminishing cries of his shipmates, so long ago. But not even a whole season had passed since their battle cruiser had thrown off the morning lines to steam away into the North Sea, a wolf among sheep. Now that wolf had been horribly wounded by English wolfhounds. Only five hours prior, Franz and his shipmates had been on deck, smoking cigarettes and making lewd jokes about the terrible things they would do to the wives of their British adversaries. Mary won't be walking right, not when I'm done with her, Matrose Schmidt boasted, eliciting jeers from his closest friends. Mary won't even notice if anything has happened to her, Gerhard, Miller had shouted, his pinky fingers waggling. Poor Mary would be bored, Schmidt, let the real man have her, Franz had laughed. Common insults amongst the three of them, best mates from the training all the way to the fleet. But now Ernst Miller and Gerhard Schmidt were in the burning black, the cramped, dying space now nearly silent of man's pleas. Franz began crying again, not for him, but for his family and friends, those closest to him who he would not see again, not unless he hurried. He was weak, though. He was weak and nauseous, beginning to feel tired, and his hand barely managed to slip the bolt over the stump of his leaking arm. Stop sniveling, Matrose! The chief barked. Yes, Hoba Boatsman, where are you? Franz asked sharply, a sob lodged in his throat. He looked around, but couldn't see anything in the oppressive, dark and greasy smoke. The seaman fumbled with the belt until it was looped around the meaty stump of his arm and pulled tight. Franz screamed against the stabbing, searing pain, but the fabric's webbing squeezed what was left of the mangled flesh until blood stopped leaking from its severed vessels. Cinch it tight, Matrose! The chief barked angrily. Cinch it if you don't want to die! Help me, Oberbootsmann! Franz cried. Then he pulled tighter, an anguished cry escaping his clamped lips, and the belt slipped momentarily, but he finally managed to get it tight, then tucked the loose end under his armpit, where its additional bulk helped to further stem the flow of blood. More cries rose up in the darkness, far fewer than before. One of them was a shrill voice, the voice of a man who just escaped boyhood, and it was a voice that Power knew well. Gerhard! Franz screamed, an unintelligible answer, brief and pained. Gerhard! Franz screamed again, his voice rising to a shriek. Gerhard, come to me! Come to my voice! It's Franz! Bauer strained his ears to listen to the sullen darkness, groaning from somewhere, a few cries, but none were shrill. Gerhard! Franz shrieked again, but now his cries were answered by silence. Bauer tried to cry. He tried to weep for his friend. But nothing came out. Not a tear now, for his tears were spent. Exhausted, in pain and with a swimming head, Franz slipped into unconsciousness on the precariously tilting deck plates. Wildflowers dotted the hillsides around a little alpine farm. It certainly was not much, but Herr Bauer was immensely proud. His family had been serfs, peasants toiling under the heavy boot of landowners, but Herr Bauer, through hard work and guile, had managed to get a little plot of land to call his own. There, where the Bavarian Alps met lush fields amongst rolling hills, he raised a family. Herr Bauer was also proud of Franz, his little boy, with a streak of blonde hair and a mischievous grin perpetually stretching across his freckled face, who had grown into a tall and handsome man. Of course, Herr Bauer was concerned about the war. So many went off and never came back, and if, by God's fortune, they did return, most of them held scars, whether or not they were visible. His boy, though, was joining the Kaiserliche Marine, the navy of the German Empire. If Franz went to war, then it would be on the seas, and his chances to coming home alive and whole were much better than being blown to bits on the front. Herr Bauer breathed a sigh of relief. 
The sun was up, and though he had let Franz sleep in a little, it was time for him to go. As the old man peeked through the bedroom's door, he nearly didn't wake his son. If he awoke, then he would leave, which was a nearly unbearable pain for Herr Bauer to bear. Franz was a man now, just so. But laying asleep in bed, he looked like the little blond-haired boy with the mischievous grin. Franz, he said, his creaking voice a touch above her whisper. Franz, it's time to go. Wake up, son. Wake up. Wake up! The Oberbootsmann's voice rasped through oily blackness. Wake up, Matrose Bauer! Wake up! Franz twitched his eyes, snapping open at Becker's admonishment. I'm awake, Oberbootsmann, the seaman mumbled. You must get out, boy! Up the ladder! Franz rolled onto his stomach, his missing arm a mess of burning fire. The pain was no longer excruciating, and though a dull ache drummed through his body and the stump felt as if it were a flame, its debilitating agony had faded into a horrid memory. The seaman used his remaining hand to grasp at the stairs and kicked with his feet. Too worn and weary to stand, the long minutes ticked away as he worked painstakingly up the metal treats of the battle cruiser's ladder well. Up he went, tread by slippery tread, and the ship began to list more. Hurry, goddamn! Hurry if you don't want to die! The coarse old seaman cursed at Franz. He pushed with his toes, inches at a time, grunting against the pain as he reached out with raw fingers to grab the next ladder's tread. His hand slipped once, the nails on his ring finger catching in the ladder's tread to tear painfully back. The matrose grimaced against this newly searing pain, tasted oil and blood as he took hold of the nail with his teeth to give it a good dank before resuming the upward crawl towards freedom, towards life. Time and again, Franz pushed, pulled, then pushed and pulled until he reached the top of the ladder well. Pausing to catch his breath, the caustic smoke was thicker here and he began to cough. It's no time for a smoke break, Matrose Bauer! Move your ass! The Oberbootsmann cried, but Franz had once again fallen unconscious. Battlecruiser Lutzo was a sight to behold for an ignorant farm boy. She was new, she was massive, and she was deadly. Freshly minted Matrose Franz Bauer looked upon her with awe. Great cannon turrets sat proudly fore and aft, and her superstructure was studded with small guns, some two dozen in all, with her twin mast standing tall and proud, a floating fortress, a leviathan to take the fight to the heated English. Yet even the mighty Lützow was drafted by the grotesquely large dreadnoughts of the North Sea Fleet. Bauer gawked at the ships and marveled at the smells of the sea, salt air, a faint fishiness on the breeze, the reek of oily exhaust as the ship's boilers built steam. Gulls swooped and caught in their never-ending search for crabs of herring and oyster which the Kaiserliche Marine sailors would toss in the air, a boyish game to while away what little dead time they had. Soon we will sail, Franz thought, soon we will hunt. On this day, Matrose Bauer, seaman of the mighty Kaiserliche Marine, was a warrior of the sea. Until, that is, Oberbootsmann Becker opened the maw, which lay hidden within a mass of grey-brown beard, a burning cigarette perched precariously on the cliff of his lower lip. He barked at the sailors fresh out of training, knowing that all they had been taught were the simplest of skills. The lessons in drill and seamanship barely enough to keep them alive, even on the mildest of days. And so he would drive them hard over these next months. The seamen in his charge would hate him, they would hate their lives, but Oberbootsmann Becker would do it out of fatherly love. Yes, they were young and unsalted, and if they lived, if they grew into true men of the sea, then, years later, they would remember his lessons, and they would pound those trials into their freshly minted seamen, even long after Becker was gone. So opening his great big mouth to split that great big beard, Oberbootsmann Becker barked at the boys to move their asses, because Captain Hada would not delay sailing for some unblooded, saltless, gawked-faced young seaman. Move your ass! Oberbootsmann Becker screamed. Franz woke for a second time. He was so weak, so tired, he just wanted to close his eyes and go to sleep. So he laid his head down again, weak coughs failing to expel the noxious smoke from the young seaman's burning lungs. 
Do not give up on me, Matrose Bauer. Do not give up on your family. Do not give up on your Kaiser. Franz lifted his head, willing heavy eyelids open. Weak light from the flames filtered through thick black smoke. There, just in front of him, the heavy steel door loomed, a portal to heaven. Franz soaped once from pain and relief, then wheeled himself forward, forcing his way the few meters to the door, and his energy waned. The old salty chief barked at him once more. Matrose Bauer, you're almost there! Do not give up on me, son! Pull yourself forward! That's it! You have an iron will within you, Bauer! Fight through the pain! Ignore the devil that is telling you to sleep! He only wants you to join him in hell! Fight, Bauer! Fight! Franz forced himself to his knees and grabbed the door's handle, absurd waves of relief pouring over his tortured body. He had made it. Salvation now lay between him and an inch of steel, and Bauer could nearly taste the fresh salt air on his tongue. He pressed his knees against the bulkhead and pulled, pulled with every tortured muscle in his body. The door didn't budge. With a sob, Matrose Bauer realized the door was sealed, a dozen dogs thrown to make the battery water tight. He slunk to the deck without bothering to cough the greasy smoke from his lungs. His good shoulder pressed against the door as if willing it to be thrown open. What for? he thought in defeat. I am sealed in. I do not even have a dogging wrench, and there are worse places to die than with my friends. So close to freedom, so close to life, yet left wanting for a piece of pipe to undock the door, Matrose Franz Bauer mindlessly tapped at the steel with his knuckles. Faint, nearly imperceptible, he tap, tap, tapped on the metal door and once again fell out of consciousness. Oberbootsmann Becker, gunnery chief of Lützow's forwardmost battery of 30 centimeters guns, was proud of his crew, proud of the boys, but mostly he was proud to be the gunnery chief of such a deadly machine. Each battery held two of the gigantic barrels, each barrel capable of hurling 900 pounds of hell over 18 kilometers. And the Oberbootsmann was given the honor of leading the boys of battery number one. Becker was, by nature and by training, gruff and uncompromising. Complacency led to laziness, and laziness led to casualties. So his men drilled and drilled, and when they were too tired to continue, he drilled them more. The English won't wait for you sons of bitches to be rested, he yelled during the drills, a cigarette waggling with every breath. They won't wait, and neither will I. Matrose Bauer feared and worshipped the Oberbootsmann. He was the chief, and he was a hard man. But he loved them, every one of the men of battery number one. Such a fatherly instinct was plain to Franz, who had seen the same hardness and love on his own father's face, and Becker had taken the place of Herr Bauer in Franz's eyes. If anyone would see him home safe, Oberbootsmann Becker would. Franz was sure of it. Clear night air poured into the battery, a sudden charge of salt air causing Franz to cough violently. Smoke rolled from the open door and Bauer fell backward, collapsing onto the sea-washed deck of the Lützo. Shocked into consciousness, Franz rolled onto his back and painted, with his tortured lungs pulling in gobs of sea air until he began to retch. Sailors, his shipmates surrounded him, a cacophony of, he's alive, and we've got one, filling the night sky. Hands pulled at the seamen, Franz's shipmates frantically hauling him to a lifeboat. The Oberbootsmann, Franz yelled in horror. Oberbootsmann, Becker's in the battery! Franz fought against the very hands which offered salvation. Oberbootsmann, Becker, he's still in there! Get him! Ignoring his cries, they dragged Franz into the lifeboat as he struggled. Someone get Becker! Someone get Oberbootsmann, Becker! Matrose Bauer sobbed and then the little craft dropped into the sea. The Lützow was dying, its stern beginning to rise in the air. Rough hand pulled away from Franz, only to be replaced by the taut face of Oberleutnant zur See Wolf, Franz's gunnery officer. He was young, but his eyes betrayed a newfound age, the look of a man who had cheated death. Oberbootsmann Becker is dead, son, the officer said flatly. He isn't, Franz swore in anger. He helped me live. Wolf shook his head somberly. I'm telling you he's dead. Oberbootsmann Becker was killed in the first salvo. Bauer began to cry, fevered sobs wrecking his body. He led me to the door, sir. Becker led me to the door. I'm alive because of him. 
Listen to me, Matrose Bauer, the officer said, his eyes boring holes into Franz's soul. Becker was standing next to me when the first shell hit. I saw him die, seamen. Oberbootsmann Becker is dead. 